Well, good evening, and welcome to Kingston Writers' Fest. I am very pleased to present Freedom Seekers, the African Experience in North America. I am indeed honored to introduce Dr. Anita Jack Davies, an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Geography at Queen's University. Anita is a cross-cultural expert, writer, and facilitator with expertise in workplace diversity and inclusion. She provides inclusive curriculum development and strategic planning support to organizations in Canada, the US, and across the globe. Anita offers diversity training and expert advice on issues of race to the legal profession. She is the author of Laurentius Las Parang, a memoir on loss and belonging as black in Canada. So I am delighted to introduce to you my friend, Anita Jack Davies. Hello everyone, thank you for having me. Really delighted to be invited to this year's event. And I was especially delighted to meet uh, Linda on the phone a few days ago. And I promised her that we would rock it tonight. So. <laughs> Linda Spaulding is the author of A Reckoning, a novel. Spaulding is a Kansas-born Canadian fiction and nonfiction writer who often explores world cultures and the clash between contemporary life and traditional beliefs. Her novel, The Purchase, won the 2012 Governor General's Literary Prize for Fiction. Linda's earlier books include the novels Mare, co-authored with her daughter, Esta Spaulding, the Paper Wife, Daughters of Captain Cook, and the nonfiction book The Follow, which was shortlisted for the Trillium Book Award and the Pearson's Writers Trust Nonfiction Prize. An editor of Brick, a journal of reviews, Spalding has been awarded the Harborfront Festival Prize for her contribution to the Canadian literary community. She lives in Toronto with her husband, Michael Ondaatje her dog Jasper, and her cat Jack. Please join me in welcoming Linda Spaulding. We're going to keep this really informal, and Linda agrees. And uh, I've prepared a few questions for her. Some of them are really tough. And we promised to each other that we would have a good conversation tonight. Um, because this issue um, of slavery excuse me, is not the easiest issue to talk about. So hopefully we can, uh, we can learn from each other tonight. Yeah, thank you. So we'd like to start by asking uh, Linda to uh, provide us with a brief synopsis of uh, her novel and just to, to read uh, a few minutes from it, if that would be okay. Sure. Okay. Um, Synopsis is not really okay, but okay. reading is okay. okay. Well, synopsis is sort of impossible as, as things go with novels. Um, this is a, uh, I don't like to call it a sequel because that's such a turn off word, not really a good word, but it, it's a follow up. It follows uh, my book, The Purchase, and that is that it involves a different generation, a, f a further generation, a further along generation in that family. And so some of the things that happen in this book may have been precipitated by things that happened in the other book, but it doesn't really matter. What really matters in this book is that we have two half-brothers, uh, one of whom has inherited everything, and the other of whom has taken the ministry as his as his uh, identity, and but manages but manages the family farm for his brother, so he's the sort of manager of it, but doesn't really own it. Now, in the context of all of that, there are a lot of slaves, and um, how these two brothers view that situation is a little murky. It's a little murky, and I don't even think they quite know. I think men people, human beings, didn't really confront how they felt about these things a lot of the time until they were um, pushed to confront it by abolitionists or by, you know, wild-eyed speakers in the woods or something. 
Um, it just was a thing that happened. And the reason these two brothers are a little uncomfortable is that their father, Daniel, was at one time earlier in his life a very uh, devout Quaker and abolitionist. And so the father has never been comfortable with the fact that there are slaves on his land. The father's now dead, but the slaves persist, and, um, and, the, and the, the horror of slavery persists, and it becomes more horrible all the time. So that's the background, and then you have these two brothers, and you have, uh, at the very beginning of the book, a Canadian. And you guys may know him. His name was Alexander Ross. Does anybody remember Alexander Ross? He lived in Belleville. He was a vibrant abolitionist uh, who considered himself a good friend of John Brown's, although no one's ever really proved that. Um, but he went down into the South on numerous occasions and um, identified himself as an ornithologist so that he could get planters to let him out into their fields. And then he would go out there and he'd have a bag full of compasses and bowie knives and maps and whatever he could do to encourage these guys to attempt freedom. And of course, although they knew about the Underground Railroad, they might not have known specifics. Like, you know, six miles down the road on the left, there's Henry and Henry will get you some dried turkey or something if you stop there. But, you know, so there were all these stations and you sort of needed to know what you were doing, otherwise you were dead. So Ross's theory was that he could be the emancipator. And he actually was. He did, he did manage to get a lot of people up here to Ontario. I mean, when I say a lot, it was probably in the tens, but it might have been 50 or 60 mm -hmm. you know, people. Um, and that's, that's quite a lot of, of good work in this world. Um, so he begins the book because he, he pushes himself into this frame of this piece of land and in doing so, uh, causes some of the slaves to leave, which exacerbates an already desperately uh, financially messed up place so that they end up going bankrupt because they haven't got any workers. And, um, and I should just say that this is roughly and vaguely based on my own family's ancestral history. Um, I found out as a child as the child of a civil rights lawyer and the child of the man who was almost single-handedly responsible, if that's possible, uh, for desegregating the schools in the United States, uh, I find out that his, his great-great-grandfather was a slave owner. And that was pretty confusing to a 10-year-old. Um, and what my father said about that was, don't worry, we freed our slaves which didn't really mollify me. And uh, he said, and we gave each one a mule, which also didn't really mollify me. And when we left on the trail in a covered wagon, which began to interest me a lot, we had a pet bear. <laughs> so that kind of took my, you know, that distracted me for sure. Um, and it kept me distracted for about 30 years because uh, this bear's name was Cuff. And nobody ever told me what happened to Cuff. But I had a feeling that uh, taking a bear on a wagon train probably was complicated. <laughs> you know, I just didn't bode well for the bear somehow. And uh, then I found out that this wagon, these wagons were, they went up to Louisville and they were put on um, paddle boats like that one out there, you know. They put these wagons, all the mules and the oxen and the horses and everything else and the bear on these paddle boats and went uh, via the Mississippi to the Missouri all the way into the Midwest by boat. But you could still say you were in a wagon train because you were. So it was, it was pretty um, you know, exciting and interesting for a 10-year-old child to learn all this. And I spent so much of my life trying to put those pieces together uh, especially knowing that Daniel, the father of these two sons, had been a Quaker abolitionist, and what the hell had happened that made everything go so incredibly awry. Um, that's what the book's about. That's what the first book's about. That's what this, this book is this sort of, uh, 
I don't know, ultimate sh shit hitting the fan sort of <laughs> version of that. And, um, and then uh, we have Bry, who is in, in, in the beginning, uh, in the first story, a baby. And now he's a grown man. He's in his 50s. He's been brought back. He's, he's been taken away. He's been brought back. He has been... He has been punished rather severely, um, and he now wants to, because of Alexander Ross, he decides he's going to make his way to Canada. So that's the other part of the story. Okay. How's that for an answer? Is that's that okay? Great. That's okay. perfect. <laughs> can, can we read a, a tiny bit from, from we it? We could read. I could read. Yeah. Please. Please. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll just read. Okay. I'll just read from the beginning the little... Uh, our Canadian, my Canadian content. Actually, there's quite a bit of Canadian content, but this is the, the flag. The stranger carried a leather bag with his drawing pencils, a book of rag paper, a pair of trousers folded small, spare collar, neck scarf, stockings. Other ingredients were weightier, Bowie knives, hand-drawn maps, a packet of compasses, the dials of which rotated as he traveled first by coach and then on foot, a pair of field glasses, unusual in 1855, hung on a strap that crossed his chest. Boots, li uh, boots laced up to the ankles, sorry, boots laced up to the knees with treads enough for slippery banks. He was going to tour Virginia, but he had lamed himself after removing the boots to cross a creek and he needed to rest. When he paused at the edge of a campground, what he heard behind the noise of shuffling, coughing adults, and crying, whimpering children was the hectoring diatribe of a shouting preacher. Coming from a pavilion open on all sides, the voice was first trumpet, then flute, describing an angel that Jacob had refused to release from his desperate grip. I will not let thee go unless thee bless me, howled the preacher. And now the angel has come amongst us. Do you hear? Do you see? Hallelujah. Amen and glory. Each and every one of you will be tested in the coming days. You will beg for the angel's blessing. Beg, but deserve it. Limping slightly, the stranger made his way to a sycamore tree, large and cool, that sheltered a boy who was whittling at a stick. An angel, shouted the preacher again, and the boy rolled his eyes. Good timing, mister. Who's the preacher? My pa. It was early spring, and the boots of the stranger, whose name was Ross, left moist dents under the sycamore tree. The boy studied them. I never saw him labor with more zeal, he said, as if thinking it over. Then he grinned, showing crooked teeth. Ross edged in closer to the pavilion, peering past a column to see the preacher clothed in black with arms raised like branches over his head. I do so desire your company as we wrestle this angel together, the preacher cried, and the mortals in the pavilion began to fall on their knees or dance on their feet. Ross had given his life to a naturalist's logic. He was a believer in the evidence offered by rocks and bones, but the moaning and praying unhinged him and he clung to his post as if some alien being might really descend and take hold of him. Good timing, the boy had said. Zeal, he had said, and that grin. Meanwhile, a girl began to turn in circles until her hair came unpinned, and people grabbed each other, shouting, Glory! Glory! Heal me, Jesus! And the preacher moved among them, stepping around, outflung arms and legs, Hold fast to that angel. The pavilion was swaying as if a storm had hit. Cries of save me and bless me. Ross went back to the tree, unpacked his scarf, and mopped his face. He'd given little thought to salvation. His desire to free slaves was about justice rather than virtue. He hated the slaver more than he loved the slave. The boy said, You never been at a revival, mister? Ross said, not to this day. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. 
Linda, you touched a little bit on this idea of identity and about uh, your own family uh, history. Mm -hmm. And the first question has to do with your identity as a, as a white woman. And uh, how did that inform your decision to write this book? Well, as I said, I was pretty confused by the mixed messages I was getting from my father, um, who didn't seem, well, he seemed to take it in his stride that we had come from this background, and he didn't offer any, any explanations. So what I tend to do when things aren't explained to me is I try and fill in the gaps with my imagination. Um, I'd spent a lot of my childhood trying to imagine already that I was, I was in a tr wagon train or that I was a pioneer or that I was um, a Cherokee Indian or my favorite, a Navajo. I really wanted to be a Navajo. Um, so, uh, you know, I had a pretty wild imagination and it was, I just began to fill in gaps and this continued in a sort of more specific and studious way when I became an adult and I started reading uh, history and actually reading family papers, there were some quite uh, vivid accounts written by an aunt about the trip that the family made in this wagon with the bear. And it turned out that the father in the family, one of these two brothers, had stayed behind, uh, saying that he felt he was too old to make the trip. But he said it, you know, sort of at the last minute. Um, so imagine the wife. Imagine. Um, Levina, the wife, hearing from her husband, you know, maybe a week before departure date that he's decided he's not going. And this preacher had sort of put together this group of, of wagons. There were 18 wagons, and this is all his history. Um, and he suddenly says, I'm not going. Well, that, of course, I didn't hear that until I was older, but whoa, what was going on? 52 isn't that old. Um, she was the same age. Um, so why did he stay back? And I started thinking about why men do things. <laughs> I and can't help you with that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it seemed pretty clear to me that there was somebody holding him there. And that's when um, I realized that, that probably my great-great-grandpa, John, had a, a lover in the, somewhere out in the woods or in one of the slave cabins or something uh, that he didn't want to leave. And in fact, of course, because things had already come to bits and cropper, uh, she was already gone. But it seemed to me likely that he might want to go and find her, rescue her, etc. cetera. Um, these things happen uh, to novelists, and I feel that they are not unscientific. Um, that in fact we sort of channel history or we channel our, our characters or our ancestors. That's what we do, we're shapeshifters. Um, which is why I think it's okay to write from any point of view you choose, as long as you intentionally invert yourself uh, into, that, into that person's soul uh, and really, really, really work at it. So I had to really work at John because he was not, not a guy I found it easy to like. Um, and Anita can tell you a little bit about how she feels about John, but uh, <laughs> um, so that's, uh, well, I've forgotten what you asked me, but um, <laughs> um, that's, that's, uh, that's what happened to these, uh, to this, you know, how you, how you decide, I mean, you have to take people's, it's like you, we do with our neighbors. We say, mm, that's interesting. He's been gone for three weeks. And he was only supposed to be gone for a week. I wonder what that's about, you know? And then you start saying, oh, no, I think I know. <clears throat> so that's how we do it. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> I will talk about John a little bit later mm -hmm. because John, as I was saying to you, as a black Canadian, I was reading this novel um, and at many, it, there were many times when I had to put it down and walk away from it because oftentimes when, you know, there are movies like 12 Years a Slave and, you know, other popular media that come out and, and everyone around me is, is often celebrating about the box office and how much <laughs> tickets were, how many tickets were sold. Meanwhile, I'm reading feeling traumatized and re-traumatized each and every time I'm being told that I'm from this history 
and that uh, my ancestors suffered so very much. So in reading your book, I found myself uh, looking at slavery from the perspective of my ancestors, obviously. But all of a sudden, I'm reading about John going, why do I sympathize with this man? This is, this is good writing. This writing's too good. I shouldn't be sympathizing with a slave owner. But I found myself thinking about his relationship with his brother, um, with his role in the community, and his relationship with Emily, which is uh, the slave that, that he's uh, sleeping with. So I'd like to talk about John uh, in a few minutes because I, I might have to take my shoes off and my jewelry off just mm -hmm, to get into mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To, anything to else. John. So you gonna take off? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're a little worried. No, nothing else. You nothing sure? else. Okay, we'll stop you. <laughs> okay. All okay. right. Thank you. So let me get into the next the next question. This is a, an excerpt from um, uh, Carolyn uh, Smart's Frost book. Steal Away Home, and mm -hmm. we know that she unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, but I wanted to uh, bring her book into this discussion as well. And here's a quote from her text. As African-American immigration to Canada continued to escalate, newcomers faced a noticeable increase in racial discrimination. This affected Cecilia's family just as it did everyone else. Some better educated immigrants complained that Canadian racism was more difficult to deal with than American because it was so polite. <laughs> Linda, do you agree with Carolyn? Can you speak to this sense of Canadians being polite and the insidious nature of racism in Canada? Why do we struggle with issues of race here? Are we honest about issues of race? What must we do as a culture to confront issues of race more, more fully and honestly? I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, I moved to Canada from a very far away place named Hawaii, which was very multiracial. And when I first came to Tor Toronto, which was 1982, I thought, A, it's really white, and how boring is that? And B, um, everyone talks about, um, I always forget the term, the Canadian term, the sort of, um, Let's all get multiculturalism. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's not a melting pot. It was supposed to be a melting pot in the U.S., but here it's multiculturalism, and that seemed to me to be a kind of fancy name for let's keep everybody separate. You know, mm -hmm. if you're Ukrainian, you just go ahead and speak Ukrainian or whatever, and you you guys speak Yiddish, you guys speak German, you do whatever you like, you stay in your neighborhoods, and I thought that was kind of really kind of icky. It has taken me 30 years to understand the concept behind that, and I have come to appreciate it. And what I think is that it's a, it's a very slow process, that instead yeah. of jamming everyone together and saying, you all have to speak English and you all have to think the way I do, um, th there's, a, there's a more developmental process going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think the schools work at that and so forth. But it does mean that we still live in our little camps. And um, I suspect that for the, uh, I just call them runaways, for those, those people who ran like hell to get out of the south and up here, and the reason they had to get all the way up here is because there was a fugitive slave law in the States after 1850 that said, even if you're an abolitionist, if there's a black person on your street, you gotta turn them in. And if you don't, you will be charged a phenomenal amount of money and put in jail. So it was, you know, it was a, a fascist way to handle the problem of escaping slaves who were fleeing like mad. And so what do we do then? We don't go to Chicago or to Minneapolis or someplace, we go to Canada. And Canada suddenly, you know, jumped, had perhaps, well, Ontario presumably had something like 60,000 escaped slaves. A lot of these people probably had no education, uh, and they were given crap land um, with no preparation for the kinds of winters and so forth. We all know these things. So surely, uh, after all the good feelings, you know, we're so wonderful, we love immigrants, um, we may experience this in another four or five years here. We don't know. I mean, it takes a lot of education to love outsiders. 
on your land. That's just the way it is. And I'm sure that those people were shocked often by the fact that they were told that their children had to go to separate schools or they had to sit in a separate church or uh, they weren't allowed to shop in the store down the street. Yeah? Right. Yeah. I really also um, struggled with the fact that, again, as, as, as a black Canadian uh, woman growing up in Canada, um, what we're told about blackness here is that um, there was this thing called the Underground Railroad. But beside that, I'm often made to feel like, I just arrived. We just got here last week, <laughs> you know? And, and I'm wondering, uh, can you speak to that? Because um, I am black Canadian, but my family is from Trinidad. And there's a huge uh, cultural piece operating there with respect to culture and identity. Mm -hmm. And so although I, I relate to the African-American experience, I am very much entrenched in a, a Caribbean, sort of black Caribbean Canadian identity, which is sometimes confusing, right? Yeah. Uh, can you speak to that at all? Well, it's hard for me to speak to because I haven't experienced it, but I'll tell you that I had a student who was, uh, uh, her parents had come up during the 60s. Right. Uh, you guys may know about him. He was a black uh, football player, quarterback, and he wasn't allowed to be a quarterback in the States, so he came up here to, um, to, uh, to play with the NFL and was allowed to be a quarterback and that's all cool and so she she has American black American parents but when she went to school in I think it was Mississauga maybe Etobicoke someplace around the outskirts of Toronto she was misunderstood and teased mm -hmm. because all the other kids who looked like her were from the Caribbean right and they ate different food and they spoke differently and mm -hmm. they had different jokes mm -hmm. and she felt completely out of it so I mean there's that absolutely right absolutely now i do want to move into uh john with this question <laughs> if you would allow me i will T taking taking the shoes off <laughs> i'll take mine off too okay off we go um, She's barefoot. <laughs> taking the jewelry off <laughs> <laughs> mm, I that much. linda can you share with the audience how you developed the character of john dickinson john is a man of contradictions mm. He is a preacher, but he's having an affair with one of his slaves, Emily. He is a slave owner, but as a reader, I found myself sympathizing with him, especially concerning his toxic relationship with his brother, Benjamin. Um, I, think, I think the thing that we try and do as writers is really get inside our people. And so I needed to really get inside that guy as well as really get inside Bry, which was harder for me, a lot harder, because Bry's experience, Bry is the slave who, who makes his great dashing escape, um, which I hope is extremely exciting. Um, that's an experience that is almost unimaginable for me, the life that he had led. John's life I can imagine pretty easily. Okay. I think John, I mean, John is a direct paternal ancestor, and I know what my father was like, and I have a pretty good idea what my grandfather was like, and they were stern, um, pretty cold, hmm. but also passionate. Okay, Okay. so, um, and they were loyal. He was loyal to his wife, you know, he, and I, I think that what we, what we forget, all of us, is how much time we spend in denial. Hmm. I mm -hmm. mean, we deny the things about ourselves that we don't want to think about. Mm -hmm. um, John really doesn't consider his um, his uh, fractured uh, the 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 fact that his soul is actually probably fractured mm -hmm. by these by these acts. Mm -hmm. He is concerned about slavery. Mm -hmm. He thinks that it's probably not okay. He doesn't like the way his brother handles things, but he doesn't do anything about it because, well, his his uh, life depends on this right. farm, you know, Absolutely. and the farm depends on the workers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's all this kind of um, this thing that we all do, which mm -hmm. is we don't look at ourselves absolutely. Um, uh, realistically when we look in the mirror or when we examine our souls at night. Mm -hmm. um, and what he knows is that this woman is the most exciting thing that's ever happened to him. 
and he doesn't fully understand it, but he tells himself that he's mm -hmm. taking care of her, okay. that he's protecting her, mm -hmm. that his brother hasn't been good to her, right. and therefore he has to stand between the brother and the slave woman. Right. And she's had many, many children by the brother. Right. You know, she's she's been bred and bred and bred, not actually purposefully, but she has she has had many children by this older brother. And uh, then he finds that she is with child by him. John finds this, or so she says. And I hope I've written it in such a way that maybe you wonder, and maybe you even wonder if how much she is exploiting her situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a lot of concern from a couple of editors about that point, and I said, I think most women who are imprisoned will use whatever they've got, you know, mm -hmm. to save themselves and their kids. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, it, isn't, it isn't clear that she's doing that. I mean, she's definitely exploited. Uh, she's, you know, she's badly managed on every level. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and she's sort of the heroine in a way, do you think? Sort of. Well. I, I struggled with that. Because, okay, tell me. Because it's, it's, uh, there's a power imbalance there, yeah. obviously. Um, her life depends on um, getting along. Her life depends on being available. And as I was reading about John, and he was, you know, fantasizing about her and, and thinking about her, and I thought to myself, you know what, is, is this love? Like, and should that word even enter, you know, my, my brain? Because I know that she can be killed or she can be sold, and that made me feel sick to my stomach. Mm -hmm. And was. Right? Yeah. 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 So this brings me to this question of shame, because as I read, I read the book, that, that, that really jumped out for me. So the question says, at various points in the book, you discuss the issue of shame, and how are we to understand the issue of shame from the perspectives of a slave owner and a slave, and why was this theme important for you to highlight in the novel? You so think I highlighted it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, it certainly popped out at Well, me. I, when you mentioned, we, t we had a conversation by phone the other day, and you mentioned the, f the feeling of shame that I would say black survivors of this horrible diaspora feel. And that sort of surprised me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it didn't absolutely and utterly surprise me, but it sort of surprised me because I hadn't quite put it in that l light. And then I, I think we, s we talked about the fact that there's a difference between shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure John or Benjamin, his brother, feels any shame. Okay. He might feel a little bit of shame about the fact that he slept with someone other than his wife. Mm -hmm. okay. He might. Okay. But I don't think he feels shame about the things that we think he should feel shame about. Okay. Uh, nor does Benjamin, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. Benjamin's pretty unholy. Um, guilt? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm mm -hmm. sure that John feels guilt, and I think that's part of the driving force of his running, okay. his leaving the family, his running south to try and find her. Okay. And it's more, it's not so much guilt that he's, he's had a relationship with her as guilt that he has failed her. Okay. Because he's promised her that he will never let her be sold or right. let her children be sold. And while his back is turned, that happens. So I think he's he's almost consumed okay. with guilt about that. Okay. But I don't think he feels shame okay. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you I for, don't know. Maybe you, I, what no, do you think? Thank you I for mean, clarifying <laughs> that. <laughs> so we're talking about John and Emily, and I just wanted to read an excerpt from the, the book, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it says... Uh, can you discuss John rela John's relationship with Emily, the slave that he's having an affair with? Uh, quote, it had begun when he'd gone to the barn one morning to saddle his horse, and he came upon his brother's milkmaid with her brim brimming pail and her face with its features defined by the early light that came pouring so generously through the wide open door. Her mouth was broad and quiet, her eyes that so calmly searched his. He'd put out a hand with his fingers groping, no right had he to touch his brother's slave, but he dropped the pail. And what was the use of arguing as he pulled her to the floor of the barn, as he came to believe that she cared for him? And so I, I asked the question again, does he love Emily? And can a master and slave be in love given the power imbalance inherent in that relationship? Sorry. 
<laughs> First of all, you know, there are 10 jillion kinds of love. Okay. Uh, and I've never believed that, that, you know, if you feel this kind of love, you can't feel that kind of love. I think we're pretty varied in our appetites. Um, I believe that he does love Emily. I believe he loves his wife. I believe he loves his children. I believe he loves his baby by Emily. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, he's rather yes. surprised and proud of yes. this baby. Mm -hmm. um, but all of it comes as a, as a kind of uh, shock to him and something that he's, he, can't, he can't, doesn't fit into any frame that he's ever had around him before. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he spends all of his time preaching and yelling and shouting and praying, and suddenly this happens to him, and he's overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And how does he define it? What, he would never, he would probably never say he loved Emily. Okay. Now, the question is how she feels about him. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that is probably the only really troubling question in the book. Okay. Uh, and I don't have an answer. Okay. Perfect. And, <laughs> and, and, and uh, to follow up on that, I wanted to know about his, John's relationship with his wife, and I'd really love to know whether his wife knew about Emily. I'd like to know, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think that most wives in that kind of society, I mean, the things I've read about the antebellum South, um, by people much more learned than I am, say that the women knew and that it was accepted. Um, and I think that must be true. It must, and there was a kind of thing about the purity of the white woman, which is set against the, um, the feral uh, nature of the black woman. So in some ways, to have these wild women on your plantation who are tempting your men made the white women look cleaner and more pure, if you can <laughs> stomach that. Uh, I mean, it's all just total, total hogwash. But, um, and it's a total permission uh, for a male patriarchy to have its way on both sides of the fence, you know? And, um, and I'm sure that the I'm pretty sure, I've never really known, but I'm pretty sure that those white women didn't have much fun in bed. Not to say that the black women had fun in bed, but uh, the men probably took more advantage and had more fun with them than they would with their wives. That would be my guess. That may be a 21st century looking backward. And, mm -hmm. you know, writing this book, I, I tried to be very careful about that and not sort of cast judgment on a time that I haven't lived through. Uh, but I can sort of understand. We, we've all had mothers and grandmothers, and some of us have even had great-grandmothers, and you can see the differences and the changes that have come down through those generations, and you can kind of imagine what it was like uh, in those plantation houses where those women were literally dressed and fed by their servants. Right. Um, probably unlikely that they ever even got naked or took their shoes off like we just did. <laughs> right. uh, thank, thanks for that. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, the physical brutality of slavery. In Chapter 7, you describe an incident involving Bry, and I'm not going to put out any spoilers for, for anyone in the audience, and a gelding knife. I found myself moved to tears when I considered what had happened to him. Why was it important for you to describe the physical brutality of slavery in the way that you did? I thought I was pretty careful, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, because it was really, really brutal. And I think that what we think about is we think about this big master with his whip. You know, but there were very insidious forms of, of uh, forceful imprisonment of those slaves. I mean, they were, they had things that they had to wear in their mouths, or they had uh, things that meant that they couldn't bend their knees. I mean, it, there were so many torturous devices. And to castrate a young boy who may or may not have slept, slept with your wife is a very, it, you know, it was not uncommon. I mean, not that it happened a lot, 
But that's what would have been done. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is that when you punish your slaves, you may or may not uh, devalue him, him or her. He may be less marketable. So there's, you know, it's, it's funny, it's like men who abuse wives and they do it sort of so that it doesn't show. I mean, that they had, there was a certain thing where you sort of held back because you didn't want to ruin your property. But there was also the idea of example, which we still have, which we still use with prisoners and people that we, you know, put to death and so forth for absolutely the wrong reasons because we think it's going to change other people's minds, yeah. right? So You know, one thing I just um, thought about as you were speaking is this idea of, of property. And mm -hmm. we, you talked about that book earlier when we met. Mm -hmm. And as I was reading, uh, your, your writing is just so poignant and so, so brilliant and so moving. Thank um, you. And I, for the first time, really, I mean, I know that I've been told, you know, African Americans and black people in the Caribbean and Brazil, we were slaves and we were property. But as I was reading the book, it dawned on me that <laughs> they were counting and describing the slaves as if they, they were widgets. <laughs> and it really hadn't dawned on me until I actually started mm -hmm. reading it in the way in which John was you know, writing in his ledger and, and, and making all of these uh, promises based on this, on these people that he had mm -hmm. on his property. And was that a, a technique that you uh, did deliberate? Was that a deliberate technique for you or was that? Well, there was so much research in this book and it really did start way back with the other books. So that sort of for 10 years, I've been reading these uh, diaries of plantation owners and Obviously, slave diaries too, but really the 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 commercial mm -hmm. uh, focus mm -hmm. of those slave owners, yeah. you know, and their diaries. And it's like today we did so many um, hills of potatoes, right, and then we right. did this, and there was a flood over here, and five men, you know, were beaten, whipped because they da da da, and it's just like another list. Right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it was all about control. And imagine that you're, hmm, what, maybe five or six, maybe five or six or seven white men on 3,000 acres mm -hmm. with maybe 300 black men right. around mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. Oh, you gotta, you know, take yourself pretty seriously. Absolutely, okay. How are you gonna keep that going? Mm -hmm. Coercion. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of your writing style, um, what techniques did you use to evoke the presence of nature? Because that was something that really uh, stood out for me as well. And the extent to which both master and slave were at its mercy. Hmm. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. I always feel that I, you know, when I read books that have these very vivid descriptions and there were purple hills over here and then there were green and the <laughs> clouds were doing this and everything. I could think, how do they do that? And I also think, I'm not very interested. Um, <laughs> you know, because I, I don't think I'm really a very scenic person. I don't really go places to look at scenery. But I think that, you know, what you, what you hope for is that people will get the sense of what it was like to be inside that nature. Perfect. You know, inside okay. yes. how it felt. It wasn't like they're looking, okay. really. Yes, right? I understand. Yeah. I understand. I this one, um, I mentioned this to you earlier as well. Uh, the book makes several biblical references, mm. and in particular, a reference to Jacob's blessing. This is what I really need to know. <laughs> Can you share with us how the biblical references relate to the different characters in the book? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> This is uh, like, I, are you going to give me a master's degree after <laughs> a, that? a PhD, a PhD, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, you know. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever thought about that. I mean, the thing about Jacob and the angel, you know, I saw this painting when I was once in Holland, and it was a Caravaggio painting of Jacob and the angel, and it absolutely knocked me completely to my to the ground. I mean, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Overwhelming. And then I just thought, what the hell is going on in that painting? What was that all about? And I've read and read and read and read about Jacob and the angel. So angel, the angel is God. The angel is Israel. The angel is 
the spirit Thank you. of truth anyway. You know, he, why is Jacob, who started the wrestling? That's what I was. I always wonder. Like, okay. who started that fight? <laughs> and uh, did and once it started, then Jacob was the one who hung on and said, "You can't. I'm not going to let you unless you bless me." But Jacob, you see, had this sinful past mm -hmm. um, because he had not been good to his brother. Right. right. Uh, it was this Jacob and Esau, right? Right. And um, anyway, it's it's the idea of needing clearance from some other source okay. other than yourself, right? Okay, perfect. And I just wanted to um, touch again on um, on this idea of, of the setting. And I, I was curious as to how much of that plantation was actually factual. Well, I've been there. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was at one time 3,000 acres. Uh, by the time I saw it, it was uh, it's the house um, which I which is Benjamin's house mm -hmm. is still standing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, Daniel, the old father's cabin, is lying in pieces on the ground, mm -hmm. and I don't know where John lived. I never quite figured that out because okay. in the deeds he did take over Benjamin's house for some time. But okay. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, just just a a couple more, and then we will open it up to the audience. Is is that okay if we can? Okay. <laughs> Do we put our shoes back then? Absolutely. On or, or it? Absolutely. Not before you pass your oral exam, though, exactly. on the dissertation. <laughs> See that. Now, you spoke a little bit about um, the abolitionist uh, Dr. Ross. Mm -hmm. um, who was he, and what role did he play in the abolitionist movement? Well, he, he was really a crazy, interesting guy. Um, he really was... A naturalist. He wrote many, many books, which you can find in the library, about the natural hit flora and fauna of Canada. He went to medical school in New York, so he was a doctor. Um, and then he went on these trips down into the South. Now, he says in one of his many tomes that he made friends with John Brown and planned with John Brown the whole, the whole, um, you know, sort of res revolution that John Brown carried out at, um, at the fort. Uh, there are doubts about that. There are, there, we, some of us think that maybe he made that up afterwards, after John was hanged and he wanted to kind of connect himself to this hero. But there, I don't know how we'd ever know. But he was, in fact, an abolitionist, and he did go down and save people. And he had a house in Belleville, and that's enough for me. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just two more <laughs> questions, and this one is about your writing process. Mm. Linda, many new and aspiring authors struggle to crystallize their writing process, mm. and some may not have a defined writing process at all, like, like myself. Can you share <laughs> what your writing process looks and feels like, because I really need to learn from you, where you write and how your novel came together? You have a book. You have a writing process. Okay. <laughs> that's, how, right. that's how that goes. I don't know. I, I'm, a, I'm embarrassed to tell you that I, I sort of sit with my computer on my lap most of the time, often on a sofa or a bed. Uh, it is about as undignified and unofficial looking as anything could be. And um, I spend a lot of my time daydreaming and what I call channeling. And uh, I don't have strict hours uh, when I'm into it I'm really into it and I'll go for hours you know I don't know I'm just that's great that's perfect yeah I Thank don't you. think it's perfect it's no. you <laughs> it's you <laughs> and the final question from me before we open it up to the audience is um, can you share with us the most satisfying and challenging aspects of being an author oh being here that would be good <laughs> that's fun um, I think I've always wanted to really be you know sort of on the road in the circus or something I just so yeah I I mean I'm a ham um, so that's fun I the best thing about being a writer is you don't have to go to an office and work for someone else and you get to think what you want to think but it's lonely mm -hmm. it's really really lonely and you end up having not very many friends because you're not any fun <laughs> Well, I think you're fun. Yeah, that's because they <laughs> let me out of the cage for a little while. <laughs> okay, so at this point, we will open uh, open it up to the floor uh, for any questions, please. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, no, you probably don't need a mic. Sorry. Need a, uh, need no. a mic? Okay. Uh, can, 
Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't very, it wasn't very subtle. What I like about yours, <laughs> the writing, is that it's more, it's much more finesse. So thank you very much for that. I was down in the Finger Lakes area in about 2002 for an interview at one of the universities, which shall remain a nameless but it's the only one around there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that was where the uh, underground railway came up. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh right through upstate New York. What's interesting is they almost let it come. Almost, you know, Trump being president, a lot of people say they want to come to Canada, they really don't. But um, they were then coming in droves and, and helping them. The law was almost not going out there and stopping them, but I want to get back to coercion. I was with that CSC for a while, and it's still rampant, and it's still really scary on the male side. What's the CSC? Uh, Correctional Services. Oh, Canada. yes, I know. <laughs> very, very nasty. I wrote a book about a woman in prison, and it's pretty coercive there for women, too. I want to read that one. <laughs> Thanks so much. I think there's a question. <clears throat> This is for, um, is it on? This is for Anita and for Linda. Um, You know the phrase six degrees of separation. Mm -hmm. So this notion that we actually are closer to our neighbors than we think we are. Um, Ancestry.ca will tell you what your ancestry is. And I'm wondering if you think that'll change the dialogue between indigenous, non-indigenous, black and white, if we come to understand that we share blood with people that some of us don't like. Mm. Well, I hope so. I think that's the most exciting thing about that whole business, and I can't wait to do it myself. Although I'm afraid I'm going to find out that I'm as boring as I think I am. (laughs) (laughs) I mean... I did everything. I tried to marry somebody. I, I mean, I just <laughs> couldn't pull it off. I still have these white kids, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and my and my daughter just did that that um, ancestry.com thing, and she said, "Oh God, on the maternal side, I'm so boring." So I thought, well, I, I won't even bother then. But um, but then boring is what you make it. Uh, I've been reading a book called My European Ancestors for the last fifty four thousand years, and boy, we had quite a history, some of us, you know. We came out of the Ukraine, we came out of the Middle East, we did all kinds of stuff. Um, It's not all that bad. Um, And we were dark-skinned at one point, which is kind of nice, because, anyway. Well, yeah, I'm hoping it's going to help, but it's also going to cause the usual havoc, I expect. No, I mean... um, talk to Wayne Grady or to any of these guys who find out, you know, that their families have kept from them the secret of their ancestry and what that's cost. Yeah. Um, I think for me, I think it's a really great question. Uh, For me, it opens up uh, the dialogue. And I think it makes people feel uncomfortable to know that Mm. maybe they might have come from Africa originally. And I think that discomfort is important for us. Because I think, especially as Canadians and as a black Canadian, I feel that often we just don't want to take the bull by the horns and just kind of wrestle with things because um, it's touchy and it's about our identities and it implicates our families. Um, So I think, um, you know, it it opens up a dialogue and I think that's a good place to start and I think being uncomfortable is a good place to be. Anita, I've always wondered uh, and not known how to ask, what it's like, and it may not be your situation at all, but it must be odd to know that your great granddaddy, if you're black, was a white son of a bitch, you know, <laughs> and um, <laughs> who raped your great grandmammy. Um, how does that? Do you know? I mean, that's a heavy. That's a heavy thing to have. You have. I don't know you, but lots of lots of black people have sure. that white ancestor sure. who was the John in sure. the family. You yeah. know, mm-hmm. lots and lots. Yeah, 
And it's painful, but it brings back this um, idea of shame again. And I know that... How? How? It brings it back because I think we are made to, to feel shameful. We are made to feel shameful as, as black people. At, at least that's how I feel. And we're told over and over again that all we really ever were were slaves, even though our history it, it goes way beyond you right. know, slavery. So it, it's difficult because we know, many of us know the history and know of the, the brutality. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we do, our culture doesn't provide us with the space mm -hmm. to even say, you know what, I need a moment mm -hmm. about this. I, I'm not okay about mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we start talking about it, oh, don't play the race card. Oh, don't mm. play the race card. Oh, you're bringing up slavery again. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It, it just so happens that that institution has wreaked havoc on, on our communities. And, Absolutely. And I, I often feel as though I'm not ever given uh, the opportunity in polite company, right, we use that word a lot, to really talk about it and what it means and, and what it feels like when films like Django come out. And, mm -hmm. and, you, or, or, and, and I, 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 as I was telling you, I went to the theater and it, within five minutes I just, I, I started freezing up and I mm -hmm. picked up my purse and I walked out because I mm -hmm. couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. And I, and I and feel that in our culture, it needs to be okay for me not to handle it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we're there yet. Mm. I don't know if we're there yet. But also in our culture, it needs to be handleable. Mm -hmm. You know, there needs yeah. to be a way that we can put some of these pieces out on the table and pick them up and look Absolutely. at them. And that's why I think if, you know, if, if you had, say, let's say Thomas Jefferson was your ancestor, mm -hmm. would you feel, oh, I had a hell of a great man as my ancestor? Or would you think... Uh, that was really bad, you know? Mm -hmm. it's It must be very I think, complicated. I think, I think both, both and, right? I think it's confusing. I think um, d it depends on who you're speaking with <laughs> mm -hmm. also. And one of the things that you had mentioned about so, sort of picking up all the pieces, I feel that I cannot have that conversation unless you're at the table, unless you as a white woman are at that table with me I can't really have a conversation about slavery. Why? Because white people were implicated in slavery. Black people were implicated in slavery. We were in it mm -hmm. together. But what I'm made to feel is that, oh, slavery was really just an unfortunate thing that happened to you. Oh, it's your but problem. you deal with that on your own time because we've got money to make. So mm -hmm. it's not about... Mm -hmm. The guilt, I feel, is something that um, we're not owning and we're not creating those spaces in our culture to come together and say, this is a conversation that needs to happen with the both of us. But I'm very interested in your idea of guilt and shame, <laughs> as I told you the Sorry. other day. Because I, I mean, I have these rather dreadful ancestors, but I don't think I feel guilty. I think mm -hmm. uh, maybe I do, and I just don't name it that. But how can I feel guilty? I wasn't there. I wasn't alive. Uh, I felt surprised and uh, stunned and sort of, un I'd say, like the floor shifted because I wasn't who I thought I was. My father right. wasn't who, I, we weren't, you know, these great people that I thought we were. Right. Yeah. So who were we? Right. But I don't think I feel guilt. I just feel like, oh, humbled maybe mm -hmm. yeah. and I can't imagine shame or guilt on your part yeah I mean we're born in innocence aren't we I I, no, God knows if you survived. It work. It if you work. survived that system, it it's you got a hell of a lot to be proud of. Because I mean, just your exactly. your DNA must be, you know, like I mean, that's amazing. Because it was unbelievable. It yeah, was. it was unbelievable. You look at things like that, like the the films that are out there, and I think, oh my God, what those people went through. Yeah. And I visited um, the place over the of Tanzania, and when I looked at models of the ships. Mm -hmm. That these people were brought over here in, mm -hmm. and the size of them, I mean, my heart went out to them. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And I mm -hmm. thought to myself, you are a strong people. Absolutely. That's right. That was my yes. feeling. And how many, how many were of those people didn't even make it, were thrown exactly. overboard. Right, right. You know, I mean, it's, it's so, absolutely appalling. So let me touch on okay. uh, Judy's um, <laughs> remarks because yes. I do feel proud of my ancestors. What I said earlier to clarify is that I often feel as though we are made to feel ashamed. Not that I am ashamed mm. of my ancestors, mm. but that in our culture, mm. I am made to feel mm -hmm. ashamed. And I think, I think there's a big difference there. There is a difference. Right? Because in terms of resiliency and in terms of surviving, mm -hmm. I have a lot to be proud of because I, I'm here. <laughs> the right. fact that I'm here right. tells me that I've, I've survived. Right. But there are many, many, um, the conditions in our, there are many factors that are operating in our culture that I feel make marginalized peoples and not just black people, but indigenous people and other groups, we are made to feel as though we are not okay. You're made to feel as if you've lost or you are losers. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I just wanted yeah. to clarify that, but thank you. Thank All right. You. Hi, uh, my name is Nadia Hahn. I'm a teacher and also an author. Um, I just finished, well, I'm still kind of working on the final drafts of a uh, early reader about Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to touch on a couple things, but also ask a question. Um, there was a comment about Ancestry.ca. Mm -hmm. um, I joined Ancestry.com or .ca and quickly realized what I suspected, that I could only go so far back. Mm -hmm. So I can go back to Germany, because my great, 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 probably about post-emancipation Jamaica, they had people coming in from all around the world, and Germany was one of the places, and that was where my last name comes from. Um, but I don't have any touch with that side. And f um, so, and then there, of course, is the African, West African side, which I cannot trace. Um, I might be able to do some genetic testing to say this is the region or this is the area, but I don't have any way of tracing that. So I don't think it, unfortunately, because of history, we don't all have the same access to, to say exactly where we come from and, and whatnot. So I, that was something that I knew all along, but it was just uh, emphasized when I did the ancestry.ca. Um, Second thing I want to just comment, yes, and in terms of the, the transatlantic slave trade, the number of slaves, actually the estimate I think is only out of 100, only maybe half, 50% to 65 made it across. Yeah. Um, so that is very true. Um, and I just, I find it fascinating how they were able to survive in those conditions. And some of those conditions, um, they say for some reason, um, like w one of the reasons why um, there's a higher percentage of hypertension and diabetes in blacks in the side of the um, Atlantic is because of those those things that were genetically predis allowed people to survive that transatlantic passage, mm. um, being compressed in a hot sweltering environment where you're not getting proper nutrition and glucose levels and salt and all that those kinds of things, um, your body had to have some sort of genetic adaptation, physiological adaptation to those conditions. And hence, when they have arrived here, they're able to survive that trip. And then the, the descendants of that are now uh -huh. that, m uh, this is according to Dr. Oz, and I've also seen <laughs> other <laughs> evidence of that, but there, I but there is some yeah. thing to be said about that. It was an adaptation, and, and now because of our diets have changed, now then you have higher levels of certain illnesses. So I wanted to mention that too. Um, interestingly enough, I, ca I missed the part you mentioned an ancestor named Ross. Mm -hmm. And what was the full name? Uh, no, not an ancestor, a man who lived in, a Canadian whose okay. name is Alexander Ross. And he had roots in the States? Uh, no, I think okay. he was fully Canadian. Okay. okay. But he, he did study in the States and he went down there and... Sure and carried on a pace trying to rescue people. Okay, that was my question because I wanted to clarify, because I know Harriet Tubman's birth name was Araminta Ross. So I wanted to see if there was really a connection. Really interesting. Yeah. Um, so Scottish, my it's a Scottish name, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, so my, I guess my other question or comment observation is that, um, and this touches on something Anita had mentioned, is just watching 
films that feeling re-traumatized by the um, events in them. Um, the man who mentioned Django, um, I had to shut my eyes through a lot of it, but I didn't leave the theater. It was very hard to watch. I was many of the, slav the slavery movies, as my brother would call them, the slavery movies. He, um, I have family members who can't all watch these movies at all. My mom, my brother, they will not watch them. Mm -hmm. But um, I watched Django, wanted to see it, and I covered my eyes through a lot of it because it was very difficult to see. But I think it's, it's a perspective we're not used to seeing. Mm -hmm. You know, what if, I mean, this, the, the enslaved person fights back and wreaks havoc and is empowered and, and is not, is it flips the victim and it is actually smarter than the, the slave master. We're not used, we're used to seeing, it's mm -hmm. kind of a trope that's been in, in the trickster. It's a trope in a lot of West African traditions. Mm -hmm. um, Harriet Tubman and Nancy, there's so many um, manifestations of that in West African tradition and African oral tradition of just people who take the, the people who are the most um, disenfranchised, but then they take and use that advantage. But Okay, I digress. <laughs> my, my comment is, I've noticed that there are a lot of books written by uh, white um, people about the slave experience. I'm not saying they're the only ones who are writing about it, but I'm noticing that. Um, I know yourself and the other author today, mm -hmm. there's also a, a YA novel that won the Governor General's, I think it was last year, um, it's called The Gospel Truth. Mm -hmm. and um, there are a number of them, you know. Um, so I just wanted to know, as a black person, who, when I watch or read these books or watch movies, I feel sometimes re-traumatized by the stuff. Like, um, what's the one that came out? I watched it in the Middle East. It was uh, Nat Turner. I had to cover my eyes through that one again. Mm -hmm. oh, it's called, uh, oh gosh, Birth of a Nation. A lot of it's very hard to watch. So I'm wondering if part of the reason there are more people um, of European um, descent writing books like this, is it partly because there's that, that distance mm. that mm. I, I may have, like, I wrote a, a book for, about Harriet Tubman for little children, so I didn't have to go into a lot of detail for the kids. Mm -hmm. But is it because there's a distance there? Or, or do you feel like you're maybe... Um, reconciling something for your family or for your, you're that person representative reconciling for your own ancestors or something like that. I just have to put that out there because yeah, I'm that's having... really interesting. Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay, yeah, um, that's really interesting. I First of all, I want to say about movies, etc. Uh, I haven't seen any of those movies either and nor do I ever, ever go to Vietnam War movies, um, which are very traumatic for me. Uh, partly because I suspect a kind of pornography mm. in the intention behind those uh, films. And I, I simply mean that they are, uh, they may be causing us to be more interested in things than we really want to. I don't, I don't know how to put it. I don't understand the concept of pornography well enough, but I know that when you're drawn to something, that also repels you, uh, you better watch out. Um, so that's just that part. Uh, as to uh, white women or people writing about slavery, uh, you know, that's the question of the day. It's the question of the year. Um, it's the problem. Uh, I can only say that because I pondered it for such a long time and wanted to imagine, well, really what I wanted to imagine was why my family went to Kansas, because I thought that was really romantic and cool. And then I found out why, and it wasn't romantic and cool. Uh, and then I wanted to explore what their pasts were. But I want to explore everybody's pasts. So it's not simply because they were slave owners. It's, uh, I was really interested in the, in the Quaker side of the story. I was interested in, but I guess, Mostly I'm interested in human ambiguity and how good people do bad things. Um, that really interests me because mostly 
That's, I think, what happens. I don't really think there are a lot of bad people in the world. I just think we do bad things. And why is that? And what is it about? And how does it feel when you're doing it? And how do you excuse it? And so that was a subject that I wanted to tackle. And I had some, you know, some ancestors that I really had some facts about that I could sort of use that. And then I threw in Alexander Ross and a few other historical things. Um, I've always been interested in John Brown because what a, what a case he was. Um, so I, I don't think, I can't, I don't know why we are attracted to the stories that we need to talk about or tell, but I think it's more searching than telling. I think it's about seeking, I think, I hope, I hope, I don't know. Thank you, thanks for that. Do we have time for one more question or just one more question please and then we'll close. I work in, is it on? Yeah. Yep. I, I work in the area of environmental education and the one thing I somewhere heard about the Quaker um, is that they recognize that slavery, slavery, ending slavery was going to be like a, a century in, in the works to make it happen. Um, and when I think of all the environmental things that we're dealing with today mm -hmm. and that sense of time, and I'm hearing you, you're writing kind of a, a book that takes a multi-generational look. I'm just wondering if you have any words of wisdom for what we're kind of dealing with today um, and, and the sense that we're still dealing with, you know, issues of racism and as well as the environmental issues of our time. Well, I, I would have thought uh, 10 years ago, if you'd asked me, I would have said, everything's getting better, it's all gonna be okay. Not so much about the environment, about, but about uh, the, the um, fracturing of, of different races and so forth. Uh, I can't say that anymore. I think that having watched what's going on in my birth country, uh, I think it's worse every minute. I mean, I grew up in the 50s. Uh, I grew up when kids couldn't go to school together and when we had different drinking fountains and all that kind of, you know, things that you hear about in your nightmares. And it's not that much better, you know, and I'm 74 years old. It's not that much better than it was when I was 10. So what's wrong down there? And I, I think that Honestly, and I, I don't mean to sound like a Pollyanna, I honestly think Canada is sort of the only uh, example we have of, of people sort of trying to make it work. I mean, we are actually trying. It's not working all the time. Not everyone is trying, but there is an actual movement here across the country of people who are proud to take in immigrants and all kinds of stuff like that. You don't see it in the States anymore. It's not like that. So I don't know that I have much hope. I really don't, and I don't have much hope for the environment either. Sorry to tell you, I just don't think we have time. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but I'm old, you know. <laughs> well, ladies, I would like to thank you for the discussion, and Dr. Anita, I would like to know, being someone who has received her master's, I know that Linda reached that stage for me, but what about the <laughs> PhD level? Which you mentioned. Oh, just make it honorary. She, she passed with flying colors, of course. <laughs> she certainly dealt with some difficult topics. So thanks, thanks to you both. And there are books to be signed at the at the hall <sighs> out back. Mm -hmm. So thank you both. Can I very thank much. can I thank say you. a special thank you to Linda? Sure, certainly. Linda, thank you for your work and your art oh. and for your honesty. It, thank it's you. it's changed me. Thank oh you. Oh my goodness. Yes. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> can I can I say a uh, Can I say a special thank you to Larry Scanlon if he's here, who's apparently sponsored there you <laughs> How do I get to be sponsored by you? That's so great. <laughs> And thank everybody for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Should we put our shoes on?